The Australian Wallabies were a force to be reckoned with, but now, eh, a little less so. Let's find out why. Hopefully this video will be pretty interesting. Since the game of rugby began, international teams were principally made up of players selected from local clubs, except for three countries, New Zealand, South Africa, and Australia. Players were selected from provincial teams above the club system. Mm. And the New Zealand and South African provinces would play regular seasons, helping the All Blacks and Springboks to remain dominant forces for most of the 20th century. And in capital cities with larger groups of players, those provinces became stronger. While in Australia, there were two major provinces that made up the Wallabies, New South Wales and Queensland. Historically, these states played very few games. However, from 1970 onwards, Queensland started to play longer seasons. In some years, playing up to 21 games, more than any club or province in the world. Unsurprisingly, Queensland started to win frequently against New South Wales, who were a more historically dominant team. Makes sense. The flow-on effect in the 1980s was that the Wallabies were comprised of Queensland and New South Wales players who had increased shared experience together at the provincial level. By selecting players from only two teams, the Wallabies had a higher level of cohesion than the British home nations and even the All Blacks. I suppose that makes sense, doesn't it? Why Australia, the Wallabies were good. Because if you look at uh, the English system, you know, where they're picking from clubs, same as in football, uh, national teams in football, you pick from all the different clubs. And during the week, these players hate each other. You know, these players compete against each other. Uh, and, and you don't have that cohesion. Whereas, you know, if like the Wallabies here, if the teams, there were only two teams to pick from, then you have that, the teamwork is there already and bring, bring strong team cohesion. So that makes sense. This was illustrated by the 1986 Wallaby team that won the Bledisloe Cup in New Zealand for the first time in 37 years. The Wallabies had nine players from New South Wales mm. and six from Queensland. In comparison, the All Blacks had players from nine different, different clubs. In contrast, a year later, when the All Blacks beat the Wallabies in Australia, they had selected a team that had 10 players from one provincial team, Auckland. In 1991, when Australia won their first World Cup, the Wallaby team had a combined total of 366 starting caps for Australia. However, their opponents in the final, England, had greater experience with 449. But prior to the World Cup, the New South Wales and Queensland sides had played a total of 24 games. This increased the shared game time between Wallabies, making them more cohesive. But in addition, the Wallabies also had a second level of shared experience, with players in combination positions having played together at their same local club. I think that's an important thing to look at, actually, when, when you're playing at, at international level. Um, and I'll link it to football, because obviously, as a football referee, and as a football previously, as a football player, you get links in football. So, for example, the left back and the left winger, or the right back and the right winger, the two strikers, the two centre mids. There's always those link plays. Um, and so, if you've got good team cohesion between those set players... So, for example, maybe the front row, uh, the front row, if, if they are, if they're from the same team and they play together each, each and every week, then they will have that understanding, won't they? So that certainly would help. Two of these players in the back line had even played together from the age of 12. By comparison, the English team had players from six different clubs from the English club league. In this case, the Wallabies' greater level of cohesion gave them an advantage over a more experienced opponent. There are three main ways international rugby teams build cohesion. Long-term repetition of selection, extreme consistency of selection prior to a competition, and through high levels of lower cohesion in the feeder teams. Long-term repetition of selection is best shown by England's World Cup winning team of 2003. Good old Johnny. In the final, the Wallabies had a combined total of 355 starting caps for Australia. However, the English team had a far superior 610. The repetition of selection of the English squad over a four to five year period had built up their level of cohesion. I would say though, 
Johnny Wilkinson, Johnny Wilkinson did only score in the last seconds to win it, didn't he? So it wasn't... I, I, they, they, this may be overplaying the stats a little bit because they only, England did only just win. Extreme consistency in the lead-up is where a team keeps selecting the same squad in a two-year period before a competition. When South Africa won the 2019 World Cup, 79.6% of their World Cup winning lineup had been selected for the previous two-year period. In contrast, the Wallabies percentage was 70.9%, while back in 1999, when they won the final, hmm. it was 836 And lastly, an international team achieves cohesion from high levels of lower cohesion in the provincial and club teams that transfers upwards. This is exhibited by the 1999 World Cup winning Wallabies, who were supported by the ACT Brumbies and Queensland Reds. Other examples are the Crusaders, who have had the most cohesive spine in world rugby, providing the foundation for a successful All Blacks team. The influence of cohesion in international rugby is best illustrated in the recent history of the European nations. From 1991 to 2004, the Six Nations was won by either England or France 12 out of 14 times. And in the European Club Championship, an English or French club won 9 out of 10 times. These nations selected players from club competitions, meaning they were drawing from a minimum of nine feeder teams. With each country structured the same way, England and France were dominant because they had larger numbers of players to choose from. While the Celtic nations did have provincial teams, these provinces played less frequently. But that all changed in 1998, when Ireland's four provinces moved into a regular professional competition and rapidly increased their games per season. Wales also made a monumental change in 2004 by reducing from nine clubs to four regional teams. Scotland, with only two teams, also joined this competition with Welsh and Irish clubs. All three nations now had a smaller number of professional clubs playing a minimum of 30 games per season. Makes sense once again. It, it, you know, you've got to be playing a lot of games uh, to to get better, don't you? There's no point of playing only a few handful of games a season. And look, if you look at Scotland, Ireland and Wales now, actually, uh, in the in the recent Six Nations, Ireland were brilliant. Scotland, they were good, but, you know, couldn't quite get there. But they were still had some quality. And the previous year, Six Nations, they were brilliant. Wales, they won last year's Six Nations but were pretty poor this year. Um, But otherwise, they're still dominant, strong teams that can win and are in the top tier of of rugby union. Increasing shared experience amongst players that would transfer upwards into the national teams. And the effect of these changes was immediate. From 2005 to 2019, Ireland and Wales won the Six Nations nine out of 15 times and the European Club Championship was won the most amount of times by an Irish club. But the best example of cohesion playing a factor was in 2008. Wales had recruited a new coach, New Zealander Warren Gatland, who had no shared experience with his playing group. For the Six Nations competition, Gatland selected a Welsh team made up of 13 players from the provincial side, Ospreys. That team went through undefeated and became Six Nations champions. After rugby turned professional in 1995, New South Wales and Queensland began to play in the Super Rugby Provincial competition against five New Zealand and four South African teams. A third Australian team, the ACT Brumbies, was added to the competition. However, the Brumbies' core group were made up of a provincial team known as the Kookaburras, who had achieved success at amateur levels and had players with history and shared experience. This made the Brumbies immediately competitive with them making the final in only their second season. Hmm. These three provincial teams were the key contributing factor to making the Wallabies successful. This factor is valued by the TWI for each team, or the Teamwork Index. The Teamwork Index is a unique metric that measures the quantity and intensity of connections between players in a team. This complex algorithm accounts for shared experiences, player combinations, and the strength of a team's system. Makes sense. But overall, 
the TWI figure is a key indicator of whether a club has contractual stability, which means how much talent stays and is developed within a club system. And in 1998, the three Australian teams had an average TWI of 95%. That in itself is is ridiculously high, isn't it? Looking at the looking at the stats and whatnot, that is a strong, strong uh, guide. I would say to how well that team can possibly perform. A figure far higher than the averages of the South African and New Zealand teams. The TWI of Australia's three provincial teams remained the highest during the period in which the Wallabies won their second World Cup in 1999 defeated the British and Irish Lions and held the Bledisloe Cup for five consecutive years. However, that changed in 2006 when Australia expanded to four professional teams and added a franchise from Perth called the Western Force. To boost the force, the Queensland Reds lost 12 contracted players, which immediately reduced the built-up cohesion and stability of the Reds. And in 2011, a fifth team was created, the Melbourne Rebels. By expanding the number of provincial teams, Australian rugby had distributed the talent in order to make the five teams competitive. However, in doing so, it destroyed the previously established levels of cohesion that was built up over more than three decades. Not only did Wallabies have less in-season time together playing at the provincial level, but players began to switch provinces which would continually undo built-up combinations and create a chaotic level of contractual instability. So this is something I bring up um, about rugby union, which I find is quite strange. Quite often, the international level is seen to be more important than the club level. Whereas in football, it's again my sport, f- club level is 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 the main uh, is the main support. Yes, international is great. However, you f- support your club. You know. And that is where the TV money is and everything. Whereas in rugby union, it's very much international. International is where at, and some people may disagree, but you know the international games are the ones that draw the crowds. Should I say? I think that's the best way to put it. Um, the international is they get so international in rugby. International games are played at the same time as club games are on. Whereas in football, if it's an international games are on, club level stops because it doesn't want to interfere with club club games because of the importance of club games. Whereas in union, as I said, you'll get internationals playing and all the good players from the clubs will leave to go play for their international teams. But the clubs are still expected to play with a weaker team. Uh, it really puzzles me and it doesn't make sense. Um, but it's interesting, as I said, how the difference between union and and football that in in union the international level seems to be it's got the more in the most interest whereas in football it's the club levels that's, that's got the most interest this had the dramatic effect of australia going from the most cohesive team in the world to the eighth and during this time the wallabies have lost 17 bledisloe cups in a row suffered consistent home defeats by the british and celtic nations and have been unable to win a world cup The closest they came was in 2015, when they made the World Cup final, largely due to a TWI bias from New South Wales and a higher consistency in selection of 76.6% in the lead-up. By examining the Wallabies' points percentage against the top-tier nations, it illustrates the decline in their performance. When the Wallabies had two teams, their percentage was at its highest, with the figure decreasing with the addition of every new provincial team. And in 2020, the average TWI for all Australian provincial teams is now 54%. Wow. And the regularity in which the Wallabies have been defeated by other top nations has been influenced by other countries who have refined their systems and increased their level of cohesion, becoming more competitive. This is how in 2017, the Wallabies lost in Sydney to a Scottish team that had the lowest amount of international experience of all time. The competitive advantage Australian rugby once had of a small professional player base that was more cohesive and centrally stable has been lost and has been compounded by a recent overseas player drain and a loss-making professional rugby model suffocating the country's capacity to retain and develop talent. This recent history of Australian rugby 
is a case study of a sporting team that has risen and fallen through the influential factors of team cohesion as measured by TWI and best explains how the Wallabies went from being the best team in the world to now being in danger of dropping out of the top 10 rugby playing nations. Wow. What a brilliant video. What a, I really enjoyed that with the with the the stats to prove things. Um and it, and it, it it depends what you want from your sport, doesn't it? As I said, you know, they've done so well in the past because they didn't really have a league system for clubs. You know, it was only what two, three teams. Um and that's no real that's not really an exciting club level game, is it? Um to, to have a good club system, you need more teams to have a league and whatnot, and therefore players play more. But the evidence of the cohesion and leading to international clubs winning, that is really interesting, and it's not something I really knew about. Um, but it is a makes a brilliant point, brilliant point. And actually, you can understand why teams like uh, like Spain were so dominant a few years back in in football because they would just simply have teams for uh, players from Real Madrid, Barcelona, and and a couple from Atletico Madrid, and they would be so dominant. And you can understand because they played together each and every week. They knew they knew each other's inside and out, um, and that makes complete sense actually. But it seems like other countries have learned from what what possibly Australia did well and are using it themselves, maybe, um, alongside the the model changing from Australian Rugby Union. I think that is so interesting and something that clubs and, and, and international teams can learn from for sure. Hopefully you found that interesting as well and, and you took something from that. If you did, make sure you like and subscribe and I will catch you next time.